Welcome to a special edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 778. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is December 20th, 2022. All right, thank you for joining us for another episode of Anglican Unscripted, our happy place. This is my happy place and George's happy place where we sit down and talk about news, politics, religion, spirituality, cultural Marxism, and everything else going on today. I'm not in my normal location. I'm not in the RV. I'm at Mom's condo here outside of Madison, Wisconsin. We are uh, watching uh, Dad go through his last couple weeks, which has been a great celebration because he's still very lucid and talkative, and uh, Dad is being 100% Dad, which is great. Uh, George, you are in a dark and cloudy environment down there. It, it <laughs> yes, it's, it's raining in Florida. We're getting the tail end of the great big storms that are sweeping through the north and northeast. Mm -hmm. So it's it's quite freezing cold this morning. It was in the mid-50s, and so I had to put on my wool suit that I wear when I go to England. Uh, <laughs> but it's dark, rainy, and I'm wearing a wool suit, so uh, my goodness. It's all subjective. I am here in uh, Madison, Wisconsin. Temperature's 9 degrees. Mm -hmm. We're going to get another 10 inches of snow tomorrow. And I still have my short sleeve polo shirt on. Oh, tan line. And uh, so it, it's all subjective. You know, I, I don't mind a little cold. All right. We talked a lot uh, last week about the uh, the violence that went on at a church in New Newark, New Jersey. And I was in contact with some people uh, over the last couple of days and got more details on that. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about that. Uh, this goes back uh, to uh, a recent meeting in, well, it goes back on and off all the way to February. But I want to give you some recent updates. The vestry voted to leave the Church of Nigeria and join uh, Bishop Ken Ross's diocese. And it was a unanimous vote. The church also voted, and the vote was 84 to 1. That's That's pretty good. All right. So the vote... Uh, to, to leave the Church of Nigeria uh, and join Bishop Ross's diocese was taken, done, and they were going on that way. But uh, there was a little bit of upheaval uh, with some 20 people in the church, even though they voted to, to, to let the church go. And an agitator, uh, Bishop uh, Augusta, who we talked about last week, uh, was able to rally some support around him to keep the church to be the Church of Nigeria church. And he heard that uh, Bishop Ross was coming to do a uh, some consecrations and uh, baptisms, and lo and behold, or ordinations and baptisms, ordinations. Confirmations. Confirmations, Confirmations. and baptisms. Sorry. Uh, and baptisms, and uh, he sent a letter to Bishop Ross saying, don't come, there will be violence if you come. Bishop Ross responded with a letter saying, that's nice, I'm coming anyway. And so uh, a couple weeks ago, they gathered, and the rector of the church, and I have his name here somewhere in my notes. You can't find it when you need it. Uh, Venerable Kingsley uh, Byra, uh, who also sides with the vestry in the church to leave the church in Nigeria and join uh, an Acta uh, diocese. Uh, Venerable Kingsley Byra was having his own child baptized that day. Big celebration, church is full, and lo and behold, uh, they had a police presence because they knew uh, Bishop Augusta was coming. Uh, he storms the doors, he storms the church, and there's a little violent uprising uh, within the small church. The, ch the police were already called. Well, Kevin, if the American police force is there, it, it was settled. Kind of, but not so much. The police force was, from the wrong district was called. Uh, this uh, church sits right on the, the, the county line of a, uh, the, the city line of Newark in a different city. And whatever police force they called could not arrest pers a person in the sanctuary, which was on the other city line. Um, but, yeah, that's the, crazy. The Irvington, yes, the, the front door is in Irvington, New Jersey, but the interior is in Newark, New Jersey. Uh -huh. And the police probably were being uh, 
very clever. They didn't want to get involved. <laughs> and so they said, oops, I'm sorry, they're in Newark right now. And even though we see a crime being committed, we can, and we're allowed to go in hot pursuit across the jurisdictional line, uh, we'll just make sure that line is very, very clearly drawn. Now, we could spend a good 40 minutes talking about everything that happened here, but I want to talk about a, a key thing, and this has been forwarded to the, to the local prosecutor, uh, is Bishop Augusta and his crowd of 20 on camera accused Ken Ross and Bishop Derek Jones of being uh, the gay uh, white bishops, and we are not going to let our churches go to acne gay white bishops. And that's on tape, and the police heard it, and they're like, well, wait a minute. In America, in New Jersey, in Newark, that's a hate crime. You can't say that. So the local prosecutor is looking to uh, go with hate crime charges here. It's a serious thing here in America. I don't know about your local Nigerian church in Nigeria, but you can't really storm churches in America, George. Yeah, I got a communication from the Church of Nigeria. They put out their press statement, uh, and it was published on Anglican Inc. this morning. And I've been very hesitant to, to say a lot about this because it's just so such a wild story. Yeah. But what we can say is that the Church of Nigeria has been blindsided by all of this. Their press state, basically their source of information is Bishop Augustin Wigbe. And what he's telling them is not what is being reported in the United States. And Augustine, uh, I don't know what exactly he's saying, but the Church of Nigeria wants to basically get to the bottom of this. Now, on Facebook, I noticed that the Archdeacon for External Affairs of the Church of Nigeria was in Houston the other day. Uh, he happened to take a picture. You know, Facebook is a wonderful thing if you want to track people. Hi, I'm at the Houston Space Center as a tourism today. Really? Well, you're the Archbishop of Nigeria's Archdeacon for External Affairs. What are you doing at the Houston Space Center? Mm -hmm. I think I know what he's doing at the Houston <clears throat> Space Center. He's trying to find out what's going on. And so the Church of Nigeria, their reaction is, wait, we didn't instigate this, and how dare some ACNA types... Uh, journalists who type in all capital letters and whatnot um, accuse us of fomenting uh, violence. Uh, we don't know what's going on, but how rude is is it and how unhelpful to say this is a deep plot to steal a church in the United States. Well, they don't know what's going on. Yeah. And their source of information is this controversial bishop. He was controversial before because he's a prosperity gospel preacher and that his objections were raised to his consecration. And the church in Nigeria said, okay, we'll do it. We'll consecrate him anyway. But he didn't cut it out. Well, he may have cut that out, but he's not picked up all the bad habits, which is he's inciting tribalism. In other words, he is basically saying this is an Igbo church, it's spelled I-G-B-O, mm -hmm. uh, a certain denominate certain group in southeastern Nigeria and it cannot be part of a white a predominantly white American organization which is antithetical to how we do things in the United States we believe it, um, it, it's also antithetical to the, the desire of the church and the vestry the vestry wants us to be more than just a Nigerian church they serve all of Newark. They serve uh, all the different ethnicities. Sorry, I still have my cold, and that probably didn't sound like ethnicity, but it should have. And they serve all that. And they, so if the desire of the vestry and the desire of the church and the desire of the rector are all on the same side, uh, Bishop Augustine is on the wrong side. And here you see that, that name it and claim it uh, type uh, theology. I'm going to claim this church for the name of Jesus, and we're going to take it back, and we're going to do it violently because Jesus allows us to do that. And from what I have seen from the videos and the different stories so far, <clears throat> I'm fairly confident the Church of Nigeria did not plan this. But what we are seeing is we're seeing uh, so this social Marxism uh, in action which is the modern-day segregation. 
just as you have people who say the United States shouldn't be a melting pot, but a mixed salad. That if you come here from Nicaragua, you're always <clears throat> going to be Nicaraguan. You're never going to be an American. You're in a Nicaraguan in America. And you should only associate with people like that. Mm -hmm. uh, what Augustine is doing is saying that in Christ there is an Igbo and a, a Hausa, a, a white and a black, a Nigerian and an American. And we may not cross those lines because our, our ethnic or our tribal identity is paramount. Now, that is left-wing cultural Marxism that Bishop Augustine is spouting, and, or it's just old-fashioned tribal bigotry. I yeah. don't know which way he's coming from. Well, I, but it, it, it is the wrong way to deal with this. It's important to the for, for the Church of Nigeria and the primate of the Church of Nigeria to know that uh, Bishop Augustine is lying to you. Okay, uh, we have many reports. You can look at the prosecutor report. I have names of people you can ta contact who are witnesses, and they tell me that the tapes, the videotapes that we saw, are a good representation of what happened. And if you can't rely on video nowadays, what can you rely on? So please, Church on Nigeria, watch these videos and understand that uh, a bishop that you probably should not have made a bishop uh, is now lying to you. I hate to say it that way. Yeah. All right, let's move on to our next story, the Global South. Ke Ke Kevin. Oh, well, go ahead. No, no, Kevin, can I? Yeah. Uh, was Bishop Augustine... I think he tried again this past weekend, didn't he? Or there was no, another incident uh, this weekend? I, this weekend, I have That's confirmation. That's right, because wasn't, wasn't, wasn't he in Litchfield, England, because there was another church disruption in Litchfield? I, is that him, or is that someone No, else? no, but that's a further story, George. You're getting way ahead. Oh, Our okay, audience expects okay. us to go in numerical order. Yeah, how did we write the stories down? And the next story I have is the Global South story, which is equally as, as strong as the, the story from Newark. The Global South has sent a warning letter to, uh, just, to Justin saying if you're going to go down the LLF path or the accepting same-sex marriage into the Church of England, the Global South says, we're going to go elsewhere. We're going to find different leadership, George. We're going to create, uh, yes. The, this came in a Christmas <coughs> message from the chairman of the Global South Fellowship of Anglicans, Archbishop Justin Badi Arama of South Sudan. And what he essentially said, and I'm boiling this down, is that if the living in love and faith process results in same-sex marriage, same-sex blessings, or whatever, then we will have a new first among equals, and it will not be you, Justin. So the Anglican system of having the Archbishop of Canterbury as sort of the de facto leader of the Anglican world, the fellow who goes to get to meet, gets to meet the Pope, that will be over. And this is a massive, massive change of strategy over the past generation that we've witnessed. <clears throat> and this probably is the most effective threat that the global South can make at this stage. Because I would say the last 10 years, 15 years is we're a big church, we're a big communion, we can deal with this problem. Now we're to the point, mm -hmm. we're a big church, we're a big communion, we may have to expel some people, and that may be Justin Welby. That's a different, George. Well, how I, how I sort of see it unfolding is that when, when we started all this, when you were running the Connecticut Six and I was uh, doing my little things and reporting for the Church of England newspaper and the Living Church, the first approach was what I would call a pan-Anglican approach, sort of trying to build a world consensus within the communion that this is right and that is wrong. That didn't go anywhere because Americans are notorious for not caring what anybody else thinks. Then we had the Lambeth, the Episcopal approach. If the bishops all vote one way and decide to do things one way, that'll fix the problem. And this... Uh, didn't work because it soon was apparent to the American bishops that there were no consequences for bad actions. They may lose the vote in these global meetings, the Lambeth Conference, but so what? Nothing could be done to them. And we've basically been fighting that last war ever since 1998. Now, the new war, 
uh, is over who will be the leader of the Anglican world. Uh, the old battles where will will the Archbishop of Canterbury penalize? You know, will just will Rowan Williams disinvite people? Will <coughs> Justin do this or that? That war will never be won because of American money, English money, uh, the desire for England to be the unipolar leader of the Anglican world. It's their last little bit of empire. Mm -hmm. England is now a regional power. It's not a world power anymore. France's army is bigger, uh, so on and so forth. And the only thing that England has, <clears throat> has the Commonwealth, which is, yeah, I don't know how exciting that is, but it has the Anglican communion. Well, they're going to lose that. And the approach taken, and it was first formulated by Munir and nice, and it's being honed very succinctly by Justin Badiarama is that we're going to take this to the primates meeting. And if the Church of England goes ahead with gay blessings, we will remove Justin Welby as the first among equals, the Archbishop of Canterbury. He'll remain Archbishop of Canterbury, but he will not be the person who convenes the primates. We will elect one who will be the leader of the Anglican world, who will hold the positions and authority. Now, the tools Justin has to fight back with are money and bureaucratic inertia. But he can lose that fight in the primates meetings. You know, at this stage, there are 25 members of the Global South. And then you can add on uh, the, 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 also, the, the fellows who also agree, but because they take money from England and America, aren't ready to sign on the dotted line, people like Burundi uh, or West Africa. But we do see a major shift. And this approach, uh, strategically, it's going to work. And then we get down to the tactics of how do we fight that battle. Now, the great thing is, Kevin, for you and me, this is a wonderful, this is a wonderful new way forward. Because then you and I only have to talk to three or four people yeah. to know whatever <laughs> is important in the world. <laughs> yeah, crazy. When we well, take it to this level. Well, this certainly uh, makes Archbishop Foley Beach more powerful uh, in this because he's the leader of GAFCON. This certainly raises up the the tenure of GAFCON itself. But what we're fighting here is something you're going to need some money to fight with. How does uh, the Global South gather all the bishops? That would take money. Uh, you can call a primates meeting any time because uh, it's uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury who calls Lambeth. But if the primates agree to get together and agree an agenda, uh, that could happen uh, January 6th or 12th or February 1st or February 14th. Uh, they just have to get together and call a meeting. Now, now I wouldn't say Foley Beach would be more powerful. I would say he would be more consequential because the, the move right now, <clears throat> I don't think there's the... I don't see the political now moving into tactics from strategy. Sure. The, the, the easiest road right now is to have the Anglican church in North America, the Anglican church in Brazil, the church in England and South Africa, or reach the reformed Episcopal Anglican church in South Africa, have those Anglican bodies, not part of the Anglican consultative council brought in the tent at this time. You know, Jeff Walton recently remarked of the IRD that the, a ACNA is larger, that has more active members than Scotland or Wales or sure. the, the, you know, the Church Canada. of Brazil, you know, <laughs> uh, all these things. So <laughs> that bringing them into the tent uh, is the next phase. And then I think we'll, we'll try, we'll, I think we, we revisit some of the things that were defeated politically in the past, like an Anglican covenant. Um, which really seems to be the only way forward. But there's real danger if you're Justin Welby, because you'll no longer get to be the person who gets to talk to the Pope, because the Catholics don't want to waste their time with the pretender. You are not, you know, you'll, you'll get to crown the next king, you'll get to appear in Parliament, at least until the Labour Party takes over, then you'll be kicked out of Parliament. But, Justin, you are going to be overseeing the the last gasp of England's empire, and it is going to happen under your watch due to your actions. If you had uh, taken a different I, course, you, 
you would not have destroyed the institution that we have today? I would say due, due to his inaction. He was uh, tasked by the primates to take care of and hold accountable the Episcopal Church. They said the Episcopal Church will be out of uh, international leadership for three years. All he had to do, Justin Welby, was to ride that out. And at the end of three years, the Episcopal Church, even though it went to all the conferences, could said, thank you, Justin Welby, we saw the light, you held us accountable, and that would have raised up the influence the Arch uh, Archbishop uh, Justin Welby had within the communion. Instead, he chose not to do anything. In fact, he chose to uh, al allow presiding Bishop Michael Curry to be the uh, speaker, not he wasn't the officiant, but uh, the preacher at uh, Marion, Marion Hagen's, Harry and Megan's <laughs> uh, uh, marriage. It, it's, in it, it's so hard to watch this, George. Well, <clears throat> in the long run, I think anything connected with Harry and Meghan is now poisonous, so oh, I don't yeah. think it did much good for Michael <laughs> Curry at this stage. It, the love the, sermon did no good for the uh, spiritual life or married life of Harry and Meghan, absolutely. But the um, we're seeing a transition here on the world stage and such that the Global South Fellowship of Anglican primates and bishops they can make alliances and they can make they can hold out their hand to entities within the church of england right now maybe the church of england evangelical council maybe the uh junior evangelical conference they can get involved and they can form alliances and they can form partnerships with those english clergy who are beginning to feel dispossessed there was a fascinating uh video from uh oh Kevin, I keep forgetting his name, the Australian guy who does interviews. We've met him a number of times. Oh. <laughs> no. Well. Uh, <clears throat> oh, well. Oh, oh, okay. Se okay. Senior, it, it, senior moments. Forgive me. Yeah. Senior moments. I know who you're talking about. I got his face. He has a, uh, a program down in Sydney, right? Yes, he does. We're so bad. And uh, Vaughn, uh, who uh, was the one who basically knew in advance about Stephen Croft's Bishop of Oxford's letter and sort of took the high road of addressing him point by point, uh, was now, has now sort of moved to, if you will, a more strong position, saying that we now need to differentiate ourselves, meaning we either need a new province within England, uh, but Stephen Croft cannot be my bishop if he goes down this line anymore. And Roberts was one of those seeking an accommodation. So the ground is shifting. And into this, you know, and it's shifting towards a more robust response to the moves by the left. And this is, you know, this is the hour of the Global South and Gafcon and Foley Beach and others to really start forming those alliances to make things happen. <clears throat> All right, let's move on to some more news internationally where things are happening. A German congregation has joined uh, ANIE, the Anglican Network in Europe. That's, in my world, that's pretty big because uh, we all know that this may have influence in the European borders, George. Yeah, it's the first that I'm aware of. It's the first defection of a Church of England uh, congregation to the ANIE. Now, it's made possible because in Europe, the laws affecting church property and things of that nature are not those of England. So if somebody in England wanted to move out, well, fine, the police would come and uh, kick you out of the building because it's held by the uh, in trust. Yeah, yeah. 1994, the uh, Intercontinental Mission Society uh, planted a church in Leipzig in the former East Germany. Now, there had been an Anglican church, Church of England in Leipzig, up until the First World War. Then, you know, things happen. First World War, Second World War, communism. Well, 94, they reopened the doors uh, and rented accommodations at a Lutheran church. Now, East Germany was very fertile evangelism grounds. I think 80% of the people are atheist or no religion. And only 1% of the people in Leipzig go to church on Sunday. So there's room to grow. Well, the Church of England 
planted a uh, an English speaking congregation, and it primarily started with students at the universities there, and expatriates. And in 2012, uh, they brought over a man named Klaus Hickel, Hinkle, Hickel, no end. Klaus Hickel and his wife Judith from Australia. Klaus was a German who had moved to Australia, he was an Anglican, and he was brought over to basically begin a German language congregation. At this stage, the German language congregation is the one with all the kids and the family, it's growing, and the time had come to spin this off. Well, and to ordain as a priest, Klaus Hickel. Uh, the diocese in Europe didn't want to do this because Klaus and the whole co is a conservative evangelical. No women clergy, no gay blessings, no, none of the, the nonsense. And they basically get, they gave the parish, the entire English and German language parish, the stiff arm. So Andy Lyon stepped in and... Uh, a lot of behind the scenes stuff we don't know and still things have to be worked out but he ordained klaus sickle a priest and the german congregation is now under the anie or is in the process of moving now this can be done because they're renting space from lutheran churches so it's you know if they get kicked out <laughs> since nobody's going to church in east germany there are plenty of empty lutheran churches to use but this is you know, what's going to happen in Spain and in other parts of the European continent where there are conservative evangelical clergy and congregations. Um, and the bishop is a bit of a, it's a putz. Uh, he's, he's not a very good bishop, but uh, what, a, what, what, what a way to define a bishop. <laughs> All right. Well, so let's, I, it's a theological, <clears throat> it's a theological term, Kevin. Putz yes, it is. is a theological <laughs> term. All but, right. you know, it, again, this, if this is movement, if we would, in other words, in the past, if this sort of thing would happen, uh, Klaus would have set up an independent evangelical church. And there are independent evangelical churches in East Germany, or the former East Germany, <clears> and <throat> it wouldn't be a remarkable thing. But the Anglican identity was valued so much, and the, there was an entity to step in led by Andy Lines, The trajectory is favorable in a way that it hasn't been for a long time to uh, alternatives to the Church of England. Absolutely. All right, let's move on to some more news. Uh, back to the Church of England, uh, eco kooks are still on the loose. They've uh, certainly taken over many of the um, national artist galleries and uh, have painted themselves into paint. They've glued themselves to artwork and statues. They've uh, sat in front of traffic in Italy and France. And now they're, they're protesting during worship services at the, uh, the Cathedral of Litchfield, George. Yeah, I, eco uh, Kevin, this is a, such a fun story because eco kooks. I thought we could talk about the Archbishop of York or the Archbishop of Canterbury. Um, and disruptions of cathedral, I thought maybe a Bishop Augustine is uh, getting around a lot of different places. But a few weeks ago, we reported about a uh, Christian Climate Action, which is a uh, activist group that believes the world's going to end in the next few weeks. Uh, I'm sorry, a few years. Oh, end timers. Uh, end timers. <laughs> end, time, end timers. Uh, a hundred years ago, they would be these millennial millennialists who said that the year 1900, the world's going to end and all that mm -hmm. stuff. Well, they stormed into uh, Derby or Derby. Uh, we pronounce it the American way. We don't say Milano or Paris or Cone. We, we just pronounce it the good old American way. Mm -hmm. But to, to make our English viewers happy, I'll say Derby. Derby. Right. They burst into the Derby Cathedral during the 1030 Choral Eucharist, held up banners and interrupted the service. And it didn't make much of a noise. It made the local paper. This week, this past Sunday, they did it again in Litchfield. Interrupted the service, held up banners, hectored the congregation from the pulpit that the Church of England's investments in oil stocks are causing the end of the world to come closer and closer every moment. 
Well, the Church of England doesn't own oil stocks. It's the church commissioners, but that's another issue. Yeah. And second, it's against the law to do this. Uh, it's against the law to disrupt worship services like this. But the Church of England is so supine uh, that, you know, they just let these things happen. Um, I, well, you say they let them it. happen. It's almost like they call the activists and say, listen, can you show up and, and give your presentation at uh, church services tomorrow? Because uh, I forgot to write a sermon. You know, I, it, it's very convenient they come in. There's no police presence. Nobody's kicking them out. And it's just making the congregation there to worship God feel very uncomfortable. Well, the verger is supposed to be the police presence. The verger, which is usually an old man with a yeah. tattered robe and a stick, he's supposed to use that stick yeah. <clears throat> to keep out the rowdies. Um, you know, maybe I'm viewing this from American eyes, but how hard is it to get a restraining order against a known group who has a history of doing this mm -hmm. so that if they should show up, you know, the Church of England going to court or the province of Canterbury or an individual diocese, going to court, getting a uh, protective order saying if these people step foot in, it will be deemed trespassing and they'll be arrested and uh, criminally charged for violating the, the uh, Ecclesiastical Worship Act of, I think it's 1860 or 70, which is still on the books, I think. Yeah. <clears throat> well, Europe has all gone crazy, George. Uh, this week, a, uh, a Danish lady was threatened with arrest for, and jail for three years because she made the claim that a man cannot be a lesbian. Another uh, uh, person... <laughs> right. Now, is this that the men who live on the Greek island of Lesbos are not know. real men? Or I don't know what... Or are you talking about sexual preferences and stuff? And in an unrelated story yesterday, a person was arrested because they were silently praying in one of those no praise zones in England. And so, fertile ground for the gospel, George. <clears throat> Let's move on. Uh, biggest topic of the, our generation, the Church of England bishops are to discuss living love and fraud, faith, uh, this week, not this week in January, but we're not getting any rumors, George. Normally at this point, we have the agenda, which we do, but we have all the rumors attached to the agenda. How this is going to go, how this is going to play out, what 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 do we think will happen? All that is missing from this, uh, what we know about the LLL talk, LLF talk, George. Well, first we'll say what we know, and then we'll try to, to dissect it. The House of Bishops at the Church of England met and to discuss a unified response to living in love and faith, which will come before the February Synod of the Church of England. And this is such a major issue with whether or not the Church of England will basically break down over and give in to the gay activists. Uh, it's taken up three, almost three of the four days of Synod. Well, the last meeting, I think it was November or <coughs> October, eight dates run together in my head. We had this meeting and immediately afterwards there were strategic leaks. Some members of the, the, the House of Bishops went to the Church Times to say, oh, it's in the bag. Everybody agrees that something can must be done. The status quo is not going to be what we're going to do. And that was followed by Stephen Croft's uh, paper. So we saw a deliberate strategy to, to, to do several things, to claim victory before the battle was over, to discourage the conservatives, and in essence, preempt discussions and parameters of debate. Now we've had the December meeting. Same topic, same people, no leaks. They're all tight-lipped. And not even the Church Times, which is, which is either in the pocket of liberal bishops or liberal bishops are in the pocket of the Church Times, not even the Church Times has anything to report other than that they're going to talk about it again in January. Now, meanwhile, the Church of England Evangelical Council has put out some stronger statements, and Keith Sinclair, uh, their leader, former retired bishop, um, is making noises more strongly that this cannot stand. Uh, is it a coincidence that Vaughn Roberts, who had been a bit of a squish, in other words, why, you know, sort of doing a Rodney King, why can't we get all get along? 
is now saying we need a third <clears throat> province <clears throat> or if we're going to go down this road. I wonder what sort of pushback there was in this last meeting. Maybe the Global South, the Ugandans, the Nigerians' threats that we're going to walk away, that are, are cutting hold. I do not know. But it, it's a different, <clears throat> again, the ground has shifted from where we were a month ago. And it shifted it in more in favor of the conservatives. Yeah, I, I mean, if you look back at the last uh, 15 years, there was always the thought that the Church of England would have enough influence over the Episcopal Church that the Episcopal Church would change its course and return back to uh, a gospel-centered uh, ministry. Here we see that the Church of England needs to be replaced. It can't protect its own in uh, theology or in the teaching in, in the, the boundaries of the UK. And we have prominent members now saying there has to be a third way. There has to be another way because we do not see within the synergy of the Church of England a way for it to reverse course, repent, and return to the fold. That's big, George. Do, yeah, and Kevin, do you remember uh, at the Jerusalem GAFCON meeting, we had a late night uh, old bowl session. It felt like being in college again, <laughs> talking to other people intelligently after 10 o'clock at night, because usually I'm in bed by 10 o'clock. Sure. But yeah. <clears throat> what, you know, I was talking to some of these English clergy parish victors, substantial parishes in some diocese, and, and I said, well, here's how you bankrupt your diocese. In other words, he, you, know, you talk about, oh, what can we do to get the bishop to stop this because, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're in a minority and this. And I said, yeah, you may be in a minority among the clergy, but your pounds and shillings are in the majority. And if you set up and if you take these steps, look, here are the financials of your diocese. The diocese is underwater. It's, and if you withhold, you know, 10% more, if 10% more income drops, the diocese is not going to be solvent. And now at that time, I was sort of, the response was, oh, you Americans, you just play hardball or you just don't understand. We have to go all get along to go along. I'm seeing a willingness today to take the measures and steps that I and others have been suggesting. Uh, Southwark and now Oxford Diocese are having a good steward's trust set up where people, instead of sending their donations to the diocese, they send it to this trust to use for other parishes in the diocese. Um, in England, you're allowed to do that, whereas in most American dioceses, you couldn't do that. So it's there is movement and a mo more of a willingness to, to do something. I think people really do see the writing on the wall in the Church of England, in the conservative Anglo-Catholic and evangelical and middle of the road circles that the way things are going, the Welby way is just a fiasco. Yeah. There was a time we thought Welby was on our side. There was a time that the, the vast majority of the Anglican communion said, we got an evangelical in there now, not this wishy-washy Roland Williams. Uh, the tide is turning and we expect the Episcopal Church to be on the course to repentance any time now and the Church of Canada and elsewhere. But what we've seen over time is that uh, Justin Welby has slowly revealed what he thinks, uh, where he thinks the Church should go from here, and either through action or inaction, uh, he's going to be part of that, George. And that's not what we thought 10 years ago. Uh, let's move on. What do we got here? Number seven, Rico Tice. That's a cool name. Kind of got that Latin flair. You would think, hey, he's a hip hop guy from Brazil, but uh, Rico Tice is leaving his church to uh, promote his version of Alpha. And I thought that's something we could talk about because it's so needed, George. Well, Rico Tice is one of the best preachers in the Church of England. He's been at All Souls Langham Place in London for 30 years. <clears throat> He's been a pastoral assistant there all this time. And that's John Stott's old church. Rico, uh, who you and I met at, uh, at some of the GAFCON meetings, and he has a way of calling everybody brother, which, you know, this, 
Okay. <laughs> okay, hold on. He he's Rico. He can call me brother. He's got it's got flair, George. You know? I know, but you know, that he, he's very much into the certain <laughs> strand of uh English evangelicalism. Uh well, that having been said. He came he created the Christianity Explored uh, education program. And it's a really good program. Mm -hmm. I've got all the books here. And, and in the, I was going to do it before COVID hit. In fact, we just had our first meeting and boom, we had to shut down. But we're going to re our, do it ourselves. Rico is leaving All Souls uh, after 30 years to basically work full time for bringing around Christianity Explored. And for a little commercial, of which I'm not being reimbursed because I already bought the books, <clears throat> if you're having doubts about Alpha and want to basically come at bringing people into a relationship with Jesus Christ from a different direction, but basically get the same, if not better, results, look into Christianity Explored. I quite like it. No. Yeah. I've always I'm not I'm not naysay I'm not naysaying alpha <laughs> no. uh, you know <clears throat> no I think I'm alpha's not, good I'm not. I think alpha's limited because it's not quetal you know it, it it's just giving you the basics but not showing the form and function of of anglicanism a, as a result of that there's 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 a spark but no path but I do like alpha I've used it and uh, it's certainly been a great function of the Church of England used worldwide to lead people to Christ. Uh, got a couple more stories here. Uh, for all intents and purposes, and it's been a long time, we have seen the last Holocaust trial, George. Yeah, this really doesn't have an Anglican connection, but Kevin and I both noticed this in the news. Uh, how old is she? 98-year-old Erngard Fuchner was just, convic just convicted in a West German court, in a German court, of complicity in the Holocaust. Ermgard in 1943 was 18 years old and she was assigned to the Stutthof concentration camp, which was in outside of Danzig, mm -hmm. which is now Gdansk or Gdynia, I forget which one, uh, in, modern, in modern Poland. And she was the commandant secretary. She typed up the execution list. She did all this stuff. And she was arrested and tracked down over these years and she was tried with uh, crimes against humanity being com you know, complicit in this. And her response was, I knew nothing. I knew nothing. I just typed. Uh, I didn't pull any triggers. Well, the court's uh, finding was that uh, she would participate, materially participated in this criminal enterprise, the Holocaust. And, but they tried her as a juvenile, even though she was 98, because she did this when she was still a juvenile <clears throat> in Germany. Yeah. So I think I think for me the significance is, and she was given a two-year suspended sentence based on her age, um, but I think this is probably the last Holocaust trial. It all started with Nuremberg trials, of course the trials in the fifties, and the Eichmann trial, the John Demjanuk trial, where that Cleveland auto worker was shipped back, was shipped to Israel, and accused of being I from the terrible in uh, so people were concentration camp all of that's now history it's all passing yeah. away because the perpetrators here's one of the youngest uh, someone who was a juvenile who's at the time is now 98 and it's all coming to a close and that's the difference it's coming to a close you could argue early early on uh in this that you knew nothing but as time went on and as the war continued, and as the train cards started filling, and the, the skies became uh, full of smoke, of, of uh, crematory smell, you couldn't argue that anymore. And I think uh, this is where that argument falls short. At some point in time, most Germans knew. At some point in time, most Polish knew. And, you know, where that fell... Certainly different between the per people in uh, rural rural Poland or Germany or uh, Austria um, versus the cities. But at some point, everybody knew and looked the other way. I don't know when that way it was, but it's not just conjecture, George. And today, we still have people like Kanye West uh, saying it didn't happen. <laughs> now, I think Kanye's got... 
I think, I think he's bipolar and has been having an extended manic episode for a yeah, while. Sure. A bit of, bit of psychosis. But the Kevin, you and I were talking before the show. Will we ever reach the point in our culture where we look at the abortionists and those who provide Planned Parenthood and link think of that the way we think of the Nazi party today? Yeah. Or, they, or people in who my mind, conduct transgendered surgery, you know? In my mind, uh, the the ideology and the madness of the Third Reich was partially demonically inspired. Mm -hmm. They let themselves be carried off into this lust for death, and and if I, you know, just look at the pictures from the most, you know, from these abortion activists. Um, I saw one the other day. I wish my mother had aborted me, and it wasn't an it wasn't an arch saying. It was, you know, someone. Or that, or that uh, former Episcopal dean of Episcopal Divinity School saying abortion is a sacrament. Um, will we ever look back at these people in the historical record and think these people were just as evil as the Nazis were? See, I, I'm a firm believer in the presence and power and the work of evil and the demonic in this world today. And I, I do ascribe so much of this abortion ideology not only to human e human ignorance, but to evil. Well, and here they had a problem. The, the German society back then was broke. They were still paying reparations for World War I. And a man stood up and said, this is not your fault. He said, this is the fault of the Jews. And they believed that. They believed as a society that this was not their fault and the fault of uh, past leadership. They believed that this was the fault of a, a certain people. Um, now we're kind of in this cultural Marxism where we're blaming, well, it, it's the GOP or it's the Republicans or it's the, the boomers. It's, it's their fault. It's the, it's the colonialists. It's the white man. It's the white man's fault. And we're seeing this where it's not being believed that, uh, everything wrong with the world, everything racist with the world is the fault of the angry white man. And we're being pointed to. It's not a complete repeat of what's happening in Germany, but it's a small little parallel. And where will this end well, up we, in 5, 10, 15 years, George? Book burnings, people book being burning. banned, people losing jobs for yeah, not canceled, holding canceled. Correct, yeah. correct political views. Mm -hmm. Uh, YouTube censoring this show, not, not letting us uh, discuss things that are not uh, in accordance with, you know, you've been, we've been reaching recently, you know, there's some, been some stuff though, on the news, you know, the you know, U.S. Army uh, telling uh, a, a housewife in a school district, you can't make these, stand, you t can't take this stance on transgenderism. The U.S. military, a lieutenant colonel, <clears throat> uh, <throat> on active duty who runs the base program saying, you cannot say this. I mean, uh, Kevin, where are we going? Where have we been? In the last seven years, the FBI has been influential in what is said and allowed on Twitter. Uh, Elon Musk t uh, yesterday released all these letters between FBI agents uh, trying to conduct uh, what we call state propaganda and make sure that was elevated on Twitter and anything that the state disagreed with was de-elevated. Uh, and it happened in the Biden administration. It happened in the Trump administration. Um, but it was FBI-led, not Trump-led, not Biden-led. They've become their own dangerous organization here in America. You know, the, this acronym where we used to you know think of them as the good G-men. Well, the good G-men are out to kill us, George. It's changed a lot. And if you follow Tucker Carlson, uh, he's <clears throat> made a point that uh, the CIA was in back of the assassination of JFK. And we know that the CIA was involved in getting rid of Richard Nixon. Um, and the CIA. <laughs> Richard Nixon was involved in getting rid of Richard Nixon. <laughs> but no, yeah, I, 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 I actually. I, no, I, I get your no, point. I mean, where, the, same, yeah. the, same deep, the same deep state. Mm -hmm. that uh, brought down Nixon, s sought to bring down, uh, it allegedly killed Kennedy, 
mm-hmm. and uh, is allegedly tried to bring down Donald Trump, according to what uh, <clears throat> some news out. I have no idea. Yeah, I'd, but I, I, know, I've not been we're convinced. We're in such a different world. Well, we're in such a different world. Yeah, so, I've not been convinced. Well, I by met that, Richard Nixon, I and I liked him. He, you did you really? I Dick? met Richard. Nixon. Yeah, I met Richard Nixon. Yes, okay. he's short. I didn't know how short he was, but. Uh, <laughs> Or maybe I'm tall, but he's short. (laughs) You are tall. All right. We do. uh, Do you think we can get a a show in on Friday or just let the the audience uh, know we're coming back after the holidays? Well, let's see how bored you get up in Wisconsin. Yeah, it's it's all snow all the time. (laughs) I'm Kevin Coulson. Well, but can we talk about the upper Midwest? Oh, yes. Okay, we didn't talk about that. Oh, we did that in the pre-show. Sorry, cold medicines work really kicked in now, George. So let's talk about the Upper Midwest. Uh, I went to church here in Madison on Sunday, and lo and behold, Bishop Ruck was there, and he recognized me, and we got to talk uh, off the record for uh, a while. Did you scare him, Kevin? <laughs> a little did bit. You scare, were you there with your camera and a notepad <laughs> no. while he walks up and he hey, sort of gets that look you get when Mike Wallace in 60 Minutes would walk into your boss's office? A little bit, because uh, he does the procession. He sits up in the bishop's uh, uh, chair, and he's just scanning the audience. No idea I'm there. Da-da-da-da. Da-da-da-da-da. <laughs> But we are we are friends, and it was a great conversation to have off the record. He's glad to be back. Obviously, um, it's he's been out of uh, the bishop's office too long, um, and uh, working back into the cycle. And he, we got news today that uh, uh, the person involved in this from the very start has uh, been convicted, George. Yeah, Mark Rivera was found guilty on five counts of child sexual abuse and assault on the 15th Thursday mm-hmm. by Kane County, Illinois court. Uh, he has 30 days asked for a new trial. They won't get it. Uh, but sentencing will be in February, February 13th or 23rd. And Rivera was the was a church volunteer. Some people like to call him a lay minister. Well, every person who's volunteer is a lay minister. Uh, that's not a thing in Anglicanism. Uh, he was a volunteer at a church, and he molested uh, this one girl. That's been proven, and he's been convicted of it. Girl happened to be his goddaughter. Mm-hmm. He's also facing charges of raping uh, or sexually assaulting an adult woman. And he was involved in the uh, sort of Christian education program at Christ Our Light Church, I think in Rock Hill, Rock Island, Rock, Big Rock, some place with a rock in it in Illinois. He was an uh, influential in the person North. at the church as well. It's not like he's, you know, the person in the back pew who shows up between 10 and 1130 on Sunday morning. He worked at the church, but not, you know. And, and the, the issue was both his crimes— but also the diocese response to it. Did, did it cover seek to cover it up? Was there malfeasance? And the ACNA did a thorough deep dive and Bishop Ruck stepped back from office while this was done. Some of his uh, sta- you know, staffers resigned uh, be, you know, because they did really drop the ball. But in October, he came back into full-time Episcopal ministry because if uh, the uh, legal team that did the reviews found he really had done nothing wrong. There was no malfeasance, no Mm -hmm. criminal intent, nothing like that. And now, of course, it wasn't handled perfectly. People don't resign if you've got a perfect thing, but the buck does stop with the bishop, and he took the mud on his shoes, essentially, for the uh, not-as-professional conduct of some of his advisors in handling this abuse case. But at the end of the day, the guy's gone to jail. For assaulting a child, he'll be away for a long time. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, say hello to all his friends at Joliet Prison for the next 10, 20 years, or Statesville yeah. Prison. And what do we what do we as Christians do at this point? We pray for certainly him. We pray for the victims. We pray that the diocese of the Midwest can uh, overcome this. It, right now, it's still an open, open wound, George. There, the, this event in this church with this individual uh, is an open wound because there's still victims that need healing. Um, they, they still have to find their way forward in an ability to put into 
uh, practice, what do we do when this happens? When we discover uh, a, another predator in our midst, what process can we have written down that everybody must follow? How can the a CNA uh, set itself apart as being the one pr uh, uh, um, entity that does it right in the future? Who learn from this open wound that's slowly starting to, to scab over now that will always be a scar in the Diocese of the Midwest and a, a, a scar in the ACNA. How can we learn so we are never wounded by this again and that our congregants are not wounded? How do we do this right? And that that's Kevin's proclamation to the ACNA. Find out how to do it right. Because um, every other denomination no, has done it worse and blundered and have left just a plethora of victims, including the Church of England and Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby. Yeah, I mean, the Catholic Church has done it the worst, and it's resulted in some dioceses having to declare bankruptcy because mm -hmm. of the damages for cover-ups and this and that. The Church of England, I'm really cynical because um, they've got a safeguarding uh, regime that isn't working, that it's political, um, every time something bad happens, they have lessons will be learned as the response. But just the other day, uh, 51 clergy members of general synod, um, uh, victims of abuse signed an open letter to the charity commission, which regulates nonprofits, including the church of England saying the church, church of England's safeguarding practices basically need outside intervention to clean up because it's just not working. Now, if the ACNA, and I hope the Episcopal Church, and other every other denomination can look at the failures of the Church of England and the Catholic Church and do what is right from the outset, not put institutional survival as the premium, but the truth and righteousness of God as righteousness is the premium, then uh, we're better, all better for it. And there, that's the last story. All done. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 778 of Anglican Unscripted.